commence with this question. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. This is a joint presentation with ourselves and industry because it, to, to show how closely we work together now in the Royal Air Force with our industrial partners. And what I'm going to do is a very, very quick canter through what's been about a five or six year journey in terms of the way we've transformed the way we look after our aircraft um, and the way that we deliver a through life approach to capability management. This was perhaps summarized in our last strategic defense review, which called for this new relationship between the Ministry of Defense and its suppliers, in which both sides can operate to their strengths under formal partnering arrangements where appropriate and provides industry with the greatest incentive to perform. Now, before we started this journey, we were at the bottom of what we described as the transformation staircase. We had in that traditional approach, we had multiple maintenance organizations spread across many different locations, four different levels of maintenance, a lot of duplication throughout the country. And we had a very perverse incentivization in that the more unreliable our equipments were, the more industry made in terms of profit. And all of that came as a, the outcome of that was an ex, a, a solution, a support solution, which was far too expensive. It was all about short termism. Our approach to buying spares was stop start. We bought some when we could afford, afford them on the spares and then we left it for a while. A very sort of uh, odd approach to delivering support to platforms. Capability updates were infrequent and irregular, which meant that every time we wanted to put a new capability into platform, it was a fresh start for industry. So what we started in 2003, 2004 was to try and drive ourselves up that transformation staircase with the goal of actually where we are today, that contracting for availability, the partnering approach with industry. And that really is about working with our key suppliers, particularly the designers and the original manufacturers of the aircraft. It's about a relationship which is open and transparent with our suppliers, where we've got mutual goals and mutual benefits. And in any situation, we either both win or we both lose. And it's about making the most of the competencies that are out there, both within the armed forces and within the industrial supply base. And it's very much an output-based arrangement. It's about the long-term approach to delivering capability, so that we can have regular capability insertion throughout the life of the platform. And the previous speaker picked up on the fact that our aircraft stay in service for a very, very long time because we can regularly update them to take advantage of technology uh, enhancements and changing threats. So that provided us with a few opportunities. It allowed industry to invest in new capability to reduce the support costs. It allowed us to flex between the various monies that we have for in-service support and for upgrade and to prove, improve that supportability. What it also allowed us to do, and this is very key in an area where an armed force is, is, has been downsizing, which has been the same in the case in the UK, it's allowed us to sustain that industrial core to support us in the long term. We've also been able to promote engineering innovation and technology pull through to the advantage of capability in the long term. And what we've been trying to do is make sure we've got a sustainable and a profitable business of proposition for the industry. Otherwise, they'll turn their attention elsewhere and we will not be able to keep our equipment uh, updated and supported. And one of the drivers has been to reduce the cost of support and a greater certainty of supply. And all of that is not just about driving down cost, it's about making sure we've got improved operational effectiveness. So what have been the main levers that industry has used to improve that position? First of all, they've been incentivized on a gain share basis to reduce the cost and not to sell us more spares. We've worked with them and they've led the way very much in consuming our surplus stock and managing the rundown of our fleets in the most efficient manner. They've brought in technical innovation and we have a contractor presence on all of our bases. They've introduced lean practices into the workplace and throughout the whole of the depth organization. 
we've been able to rationalise repair facilities significantly and save costs there. And the industry itself has been able to rationalise based on a long-term approach and that certainty of a work, work downstream. But one of the key aspects has been trying to stem the failures at source. What we found in the past was we'd isolated the industry from what was happening on the front line. So they didn't quite know what was happening to our aircraft, which equipments were failing, why they were failing. So we put a lot of effort into analyzing the failures of equipments, fault codification, so that we can build up a database so industry knows where to tackle the problems, so that we can improve aircraft availability and they can therefore reduce the cost of supporting it. We have now, as I mentioned, industry expertise at first line, right there joined in with the forward squadrons, with the frontline operational squadrons. Does that mean we have to take contractors into the war zones, into the operational theatres? Well, no, it doesn't. We've used technology to its very best advantage. And the pictures at the bottom give a little bit of, uh, uh, show, show an example of where that works. The centre section there is the Rolls-Royce Operations Centre where a Rolls-Royce technician on a frontline squadron or one of our own Royal Air Force technicians will be able to look at an aircraft, take an image of the, the damage maybe to an engine, beam that straight back to the ops centre where the experts, the design experts are able to analyse, find out what's wrong and where possible keep that aircraft on the wing and keep it running. And we've halved the, ejection, the engine rejection rates because of this sort of technology. I mentioned improving, improving costs. This example that I show here is the tornado example. We've almost half the cost per flying hour over a period of four or five years. And that's what we're trying to do on all of our platforms. And as you'll see later on, we've had significant success in many of these areas. Now, some of the lessons that we've learned from partnering with industry uh, shown here. You've got to be clear about who's accountable for what. We've got to understand which part of the overall total support chain industry provides and that we provide. You need clear decision-making processes, including decisions about the deployment of resources. That sharing of information is absolutely vital so that industry knows exactly how we're using the aircraft, what our future expectation is, so that they can plan accordingly. And everybody needs to understand their respective roles, boundaries, culture, and the language. And that was perhaps one of the biggest shocks when we started to work much closer together. The military has developed a different language from industry, and it take, took a little while for us all to be stopped singing from the same hymn sheet. And we've got to focus on outcomes for the service users at the end of the day. Everybody's got to be interested in making sure that that aircraft is available for the crew to fly, to fly their mission. And once everybody's geared to that outcome, then it's a whole, the whole team's pulling to achieve that end result. We've done the partnering approach, the aircraft availability contracts, across nearly all of our platforms. I haven't mentioned the rotary wings on this, this list, but, but all of our platforms are now taking this partnering aircraft availability approach. And we've been doing it for a few years on some of them, as you can see. And what we've been doing is extending, extending, extending. So we get to the whole platform or the whole engine availability. And it's proved to be quite a success. For example, Harrier. We've very much simplified the levels of support. We just have a forward, the frontline squadron, and a depth organization. We've def redefined the command and control of those organizations. And we've got one depth support hub for the whole of the Harrier Force, and that's at Cottesmore. And that's where all of the levels of maintenance are carried out. And we've got availability contracts for the platform and the engine. And we've saved over 200 million over a 15 year period. We've reduced the cost per flying hour by 50%. And what's really important is improved aircraft availability. An extra 11 Harriers have been freed up to the front line by the approach that we've taken. The GR7 to GR9 upgrade program that we went through was achieved on time and to cost, which is very, very unusual in our history. And that's been achieved through the innovation of incentivizing industry to work with us, but also having flexible contracting arrangements because things do change on a day-by-day -day basis. 
to in terms of the output. An industry has been instrumental in supporting us as we've surged the Harry operations to, to, uh, to support our effort in Afghanistan. Tornado is a very, very similar picture. Again, a much simplified approach to how we maintain and support the aircraft with just a single depth organization looking after all of our tornado force. Reduce the operating cost by 600 million over 10 years and the cost per flying hour by 50% again. But it's also allowed us to save over 500 RAF people that we can deploy elsewhere in the organization to better effect. And this does require the openness that I mentioned before, very much an open book accounting methodology so that each side of the organization knows that they're working together in, a, in an honest manner. And that incentivization is being flowed all the way down the supply chain, and we get visibility of that. It is a success, as I've said, and it's unusual in our country to get the National Audit Office to, uh, to praise what we've been doing here. Um, but the, the National Audit Office reviewed that transformation of logistic support for fast jets, and they recognize the savings, saving of some 1.4 billion pounds over a six year period. That we kept the same level of performance up out of the organization. And that all of this represented good value for money. I passionately believe in what we've been doing, this journey that we embarked upon in terms of working much more closely with our suppliers, the partnered approach. It's proved a huge success to us. We've, as I say, we've removed a lot of duplication we get more aircraft available on the front line, and we're able to keep that sort of capability insertion on a much more regular rhythm and upbeat than, um, than we've had in the past. So I'm very proud of what's been achieved, but we couldn't have achieved that without working closely with an industry that wanted supporters. And one of the industries, VA Systems, is now here today to show, to show you from their perspective how this has all been achieved. Thank you. So, hand over to Michael Christie from DA Systems. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to reflect on some of the things that Sir Barry said and to some extent repeat them, but with a slightly different emphasis from an industrial point of view. And then I'm also going to talk about how we are trying to take that model and, if you like, export it, but try and work with our international customers. At the moment on Hawk, I have roughly 15 active customers around the world. We've sold to about 20 countries around the world. So trying to take that model that we've just described, which is a, involves a huge national infrastructure and then work in an international way is, one, is a very major challenge. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. The, as I say, I'll repeat some of the things that Sir Barry said here, but it's quite important from my point of view that the way that this uh, long-term through life approach has developed allows us within industry to to build a financial model, a, a sensible financial model. I, I reflect on some of the comments, the, the historical comments of how it felt from the customer's viewpoint that industry were making lots more money out of effectively failing by having to repair, repair things and, and provide spares. It was actually an extremely unpleasant position to be in because we were unpopular with the customer and we were working our socks off to try and make this work and it, it wasn't a very effective way of doing things. We also didn't have a, a a financial model that allowed us to invest long term. So this approach has allowed us to, as Sir Barry said, reinvest in some of the things that will help the service. So rather than spending money trying to develop proposals, which is what happens when a request comes in, we put a response in, we do the negotiation, we spend lots of money doing that process, which is non-value added to the customer. So we've been able to turn that into investment in improved product and improved process. Also, being able to have a, a stable resource uh, base within the company is extremely important as well. When it comes to developing new products, those same people that have experience of working with a product all the way through its life are invaluable, and you can't work from feast to famine in industry. So this, is, this whole approach has allowed us to have a much more stable personnel base as well. Now, from a technical point of view, the the ability to actually work through the whole life cycle of a product also allows you to learn an awful lot more. I, I reflect over the last few years the, the shift in this sort of comparison with the IT industry who constantly recycle technology, constantly upgrade, whereas we tend to put systems into, the, into operational theatres which are almost obsolete when, as soon as they go into service. 
So again, this model has allowed us to try and do this recycling and, and really get to this uh, oft-used term of spiral development. We, we talk about it, it's very difficult to do, given the levels of technology. So the, the through-life information allows us to do that and allows us to plan for upgrade, as well as just having to react when there's a capability shortfall. The, again, the financial one, but also the, that same stability message flows all the way through the supply chain. You saw in the examples, the Rolls-Royce uh, control center, all of the suppliers that provide equipment to go on the aircraft benefit from this approach. And we, we have always found it very difficult to come uh, to provide competitive prices when it's a one-off spares request. And, and I know that current customers find it amazing that when we provide, let's say, 66 aircraft for the sake of argument, and we provide a spares price, that when we have one follow-up spares price, the price goes through the roof. And that's all about the, the supply chain having some stability or instability in that case. So if we can, if we can provide the stability, we can pass that through to, into the supply chain and they can in turn pass better prices back to us. So all in all, this, this process is a very much a virtuous circle. We do gain from it, clearly as an industri uh, from an industrial point of view, we get longer term contracts and we get sort of guaranteed contracts for some somewhat longer periods, but we are actually able to flow that back. The other thing, as in the capability staircase, it's a very show, the, the other incentive for us is the higher we get up that staircase, the more control we have of the process. Very, very much at the bottom, it is reactive. You, you have to just respond as quickly as possible, and usually it's too slow. Whereas when you're further up the, the capability staircase, you are managing the fleet. You, are, you can actually make decisions on your own, and you carry the risk for that, so the, the company does carry a significant risk, but it's able to, t it's able to turn that into benefit. So there is a, there's a, a double incentivization. There's obviously the incentivization of the contract. There's actually the incentivization for us to take more risk, more and more risk, and that's what's really happened over the last 10 years gradually as we've moved into more and more risk-taking in industry, which is effectively what the original objective was, was to try and pass risk to industry. The, I think that the international side of it has proved to be challenging. As I say, there's a huge infrastructure support in the UK defence, uh, with, with the UK defence business supporting the, its customers. Trying to make that work internationally is, is very difficult. So what we have, I'm going to show you some examples of where we've tried to do that and where we've been more effective than others. And fundamentally, it comes down to one very simple thing, and that is that local industry has to do what we do in the UK. So there, there has to be a transfer of technology. There has to be a transfer of authority, engineering authority. And there then has to be a strong link back to the UK, back to the original equipment manufacturer. So we need to still be in there, but we aren't uh, as involved as we are in the UK. And then so finally, from our point of view, if we can actually do this as we are in, within BA systems across fleets like Harrier, Tornado, Hawk, we, we can get even bigger benefits because we can still, there are many systems that are common or certainly many technologies that are common and we can share the, the benefit again. So just to show you some of the examples of where this has been applied on the Hawk business, we've got a range of everything from fairly traditional support. I've not put every single Hawk customer on here, I've just tried to show this, this sort of progression. Where with the South African Air Force, we are gradually moving up this, this staircase. At the moment, we're nearly into the, uh, the spares inclusive type of barrier, uh, bracket, but not quite. And that's going to be a, a process partly of uh, engaging the South African industry to, to get them more, uh, more able to support the South African customer up close. The, the NATO Flying Training School in Canada, the NFTC, has been set up like this for a long time. The, the prime contractor Bombardier effectively does the, the availability contracting and BAE Systems sits behind that providing OEM support and provi providing effectively a spares inclusive contract. So it's a combination for, from BAE point of view, I see it as spares inclusive. But from Bombardier, it's in the next step up. Actually, one of the very first types of these contracts was done with the Australian uh, customer for the leading fighter trainer in, in Australia. And that was, that was cleverly, in my view, from the Australian Air Force, was set in the contract. It was, an, it was an absolute requirement before we started providing them aircraft. And that, again, is an availability contract. We 
have a, a division of BI systems in Australia that does this, but it's very much Australian nationals done in Australia on the Australian Air Force base at Williamtown. And we again provide support in the same way that we do to Bombardier back in the UK. The, the next two are the, the in-service Hawks in the UK, and they're, they're slightly confusing because an, an earlier side was had Hercules IOS, this is Hawk IOS that we have here, Integrated Operational Support, and that again is an availability contract for all of, all of the squadrons that operate Hawk around the UK, and gradually we're going into this really, really complex bracket, certainly for industry, where we will be responsible for making sure that the duty is carried out properly. So in this case, it means that not only are the aircraft available, but they fly and they, they have a successful mission. Now, we're not right at the top of that responsible for making sure the training is effective, but we are responsible for making sure that that flight is effective and there's no failures in the system. Whereas previously, you, you could get the aircraft available, but you don't need to be completely accountable for the whole thing. So you can see this gradual progression within the Hawk business. And the one extra step I would describe is that when we then get to the point of gradually upgrading the, the system, as we are in Australia with the, the lead and fighter midlife upgrade or capability sustainment program, as it's had various different names over time, you then get into this cyclic beneficial uh, approach with the customer. So a very broad range of things we've already done internationally uh, with, with Hawks. Some of them are obviously in the UK. And I'm just going to very quickly, I've already covered some of these things on Canada and Australia. As I say, this is, from a BAE point of view, quite a, a fairly traditional contract. But from Bombardier's point of view and from the NFTC's point of view, what they've got is fantastic availability on a, a very difficult environment. If you, if you can see the photographs here, you'll be able to and you know anything about the geography of the next picture I'm going to show, you'll, you'll see snow on this one. And this is about five, 500 meters in the, in the Canadian mountains, very, very demanding conditions for the hawk. And the, the availability we've been able to squeeze out of this is extremely good. And my view, in the same way that uh, Sir Barry described the RAF, my view is that a lot of this is to do with the contracting mechanism we've put in place. Similarly, Williamtown, uh, Royal Australian Air Force Base in Williamtown, where it's hot, it's humid, it's extremely salty, very high, highly corrosive environment, so very different. We've also got a very similar outcome, so high availability, uh, very good service to the Australian customers, and it's very close. The, the base you see, the, the new facility here, was actually developed for the uh, the final assembly of the original Hawks when they were delivered to Australia, and that was part of the technology transfer into Australia, so that gradually the UK provider could step back and there was no huge need and you know, no logistical nightmare of trying to get things back from the UK. So that, that's been a very successful technology transfer, as I say, completely Australian nationals, and uh, the, the amount of reach back into the UK is actually quite minimal. And for 95% of queries that, that ra are raised on a daily basis at the base, they can be answered by the on-base team and very little has to, has to go back to the UK. So it's, these transfers have been very, uh, very successful. And as I say, the, the, the absolute pivot, pivotal aspect of that is transferring the technology to local industry. And we've, we've shown that that can be done uh, with the right effort and with the right sort of approach. To, to just to illustrate the sort of shift, the bulk of the things in, this, the, in the big red block here used to be done by the Royal Australian Air Force. The, the amount of transfer to industry has been significant, and it really leaves the Air Force in the position where they make the major decisions, and industry just provides whatever it needs to provide. So the decider-provider split is something that we've, uh, that we've talked about in Australia and, and similarly in the UK. Hawk IOS, uh, again, very similar setup to some of the ones that Sir Barry talked about on Harrier and Tornado. And again, it's, it's a combination here, an availability contract for the bulk of the aircraft, and for two of the bases, we provide a space inclusive package. So if I just summarize the, the key messages, if you like, from us, they, being on base and providing that focus is, has been, actually been a huge cultural shift for us. We, the, the language that was referred to is one thing, but actually working on a base and working to operational tempo is something that is new, was new to industry. It's now very much the, sort of the de facto standard of how we operate. It has integrated the supply chain and it continues to integrate the supply chain and hopefully provides that benefit back to the customer. 
partnering with the customer, but also through that supplier base is extremely important. And then on top of that, the, in the international examples, forming some way of transferring technology and transferring the, the responsibility into local industry has been a, a key part of, a part of it. The, I mentioned, as, 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 as Sir Barry did, about the multi-year contracts. The, the, they clearly provide incentives, but they also provide stability, which is very valuable to both sides, both the industry and to the customer, because neither of us want that capability to drift away. And, and I haven't mentioned this very much in a very technical audience this morning, certainly, but the one thing that has always been a concern in the transition between industry and customer is how do you maintain, how do you know that the aircraft are still airworthy? And when all the changes, all the things are happening to them as they, as they go through operational service, this approach allows that shared database, that shared understanding of what's going on, and from my point of view, is absolutely essential to long-term airworthiness management. Now, the bottom line is very important, and the, the important thing here is that all of the fleets where we've applied this model, the availability of the aircraft has gone up. No, no massive technological change, a change in the way that we manage things, has meant higher availability and ultimately lower costs. We are quite happy with that. We're quite happy with the fact that we are constantly incentivized because, as Sir Barry says, the customers don't mind us making a profit if we do what they wanted in the first place. And ultimately, that then comes another, that brings with it another virtuous circle, which is that with that money, with that additional benefit, we can actually continually improve. And as well as maintaining availability, we can keep capability rising through time. So hopefully that's given everybody a very, a sort of, not quite two-sided, but certainly a view of how this model works within the UK and can be transferred internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have very little time to ask just one question. Group Captain Sinha. So the model what we've talked about is uh, visible and can be successful only in the country where the OEM and the airports belong to the same country. But if a country like say India, where the OEM is somewhere else, if the tips are down, if the interest of the government is not protected and if it conflicts, then in that case this supply chain management will definitely break. What is it? Um, we've got plenty of contracts which aren't with BA systems, with, uh, with um, OEMs from different countries. Chinook and C-17 are supported in a similar manner through Boeing. Uh, we'll do something very similar for, uh, uh, for F-35 when that comes into service. Um, Century is supported by Northrop Grumman. So we, we've got lots of examples of, uh, of where a different country... All the examples are for NATO countries, but for a country like India, if BE support going to establish a MRO here, and tomorrow what is stopping BAE to sell the same aircraft to say China, to say our adversary, and if the chips are down, whom will you support? We don't. So in such case, this supply chain management cannot be given example as an ideal solution for uh, can, can, can I try to answer that as well? They, what I was trying to get across in my, in, the, in my presentation was that, to answer, partly to answer your concern, the whole point of what we're trying to do is to transfer technology to local industry. So in the case of the, the Indian Hawks, HAL are already doing license build. We're working with them to, to support them to do this sort of support. And we've already, it's already been seen on Jaguar that they can support the Jaguar as a military platform without the OEM necessarily always being there. Certainly, we are, we are still the OEM for Jaguar, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the bulk of the support you receive is from HAL. Yes. I suggest you know, there are really no solutions in the supply chain design to political issues. So I guess that uh, that would be a new subject for research. So we would have leave it at that. And uh, it's my pleasure to propose uh, our thanks to the speakers. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I request you to please accept the memento uh, as a token of our appreciation.